Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all uh, for coming tonight. Um, I'm Tony Mills, Senior Fellow here at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, it's a pleasure to see uh, you here and welcome to those of us who are uh, joining us virtually. Uh, it's a particular pleasure and honor to welcome uh, Stanford in Stanford's Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence uh, and our, our panelists, whom I'll introduce in a moment. just wanted to say a few words by way of introduction first. Um, as all of you know, by virtue of your uh, presence here, uh, AI is a topic on everyone's mind these days. Um, it is a difficult topic in lots of respects, but in two that I think are important for us here. Uh, one is that it's a very complex topic, both by virtue of its technical nature, but also by virtue of the fact that it implicates seemingly everything nowadays. Um, and because of this, there is this growing sense uh, here in Washington, and I think well beyond, that this is one of the most important topics of our time. Uh, and yet, simultaneously, uh, there seems to be a surprisingly limited space in which to have constructive, substantive uh, policy debate about AI, at least here in, in DC. And I think that's more a reflection of the uh, unfortunate state of affairs here than anything else. And one way to address that problem, I think, is uh, building connections and relationships, particularly to those who are working in and around uh, Silicon Valley and who can help us think through these questions. And there's no better example of that, I think, than um, Stanford's uh, high, I believe is, is what, yes. what, what do you call it, and uh, our panelists here in particular. So um, I see this as a sort of small uh, step in trying to, to rectify that, that problem. Um, without further ado, I'll introduce our panelists, and then what we'll do is hear from each of them, uh, and then we'll have time for a moderated discussion, and after that, um, audience questions. So we'll look forward to hearing, uh, hearing from you at that point. Afterwards, uh, we will be having a, a wine and cheese reception, so please feel free to stick around for that. Um, so um, without further ado, um, I'd like to welcome uh, Vanessa Parley, who is the Director of Research at HIGH. Uh, she leads the HIGH grant programs, research convenings, and the AI Index, which will be a major focus of tonight's discussion. Uh, she's also a member of the Steering Committee. Um, next, we have Russell Wald, who is the Managing Director for the Policy and Society at the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered AI. Uh, he served as HIGH's first Director of Policy and last but not least, uh, someone who probably needs no introduction here, um, Eric Benyolfsen, uh, who is the Jerry Yang and Akiko Yamazaki Professor and Director of the Stanford Digital Economy Lab at High. He's also the Ralph Lando Senior Fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research and a Research Associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. He's also the, the author and co-author of numerous books and papers uh, and has stood out for years as a voice of uh, reason and clarity on the kinds of issues that we'll be discussing tonight. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to Vanessa. Thank you all again for coming. Um, so today I'm going to give you all a, a brief overview of some <laughs> highlights in the AI index. Uh, the AI index is an annual report that has been coming out since 2017 every year looking at various quantitative metrics around the state of AI. Um, there's economy, there's education, there's research and development. Um, it's This year it's 300, over 300 pages long, so hopefully I can just pique your interest in a couple interesting um, perspectives. The index is run by a steering committee of interdisciplinary experts. Um, Eric, as the economist, is on that. Steering committee, we have philosophers, technologists, um, people interested in policy, and then Nestor Mesledge, who is here today as well, does the uh, majority of the heavy lifting along with our research associate um, and data wrangler, Laura Donna. Uh, we also have a lot of student researchers and contractors who help put various sections of the report together, um, and a lot of data collaborators collaborators, which we could not do the index without. So I wanted to make sure to highlight um, everyone who has a, a big part in putting this large report together year over year. All right, so kind of the first point is that, as I'm sure you all are aware, generative AI um, in 2022 kind of broke into public consciousness. It's at your dinner tables, it's at your barbecues. Um, you're talking about AI with, with your people who you probably were not talking about technology with 
prior. Um, there are models looking at image, um, coding, language. There are models developed in the US, China, uh, Europe, and some are open source, some are closed source. And you know, a, the, the term AI was coined in 1956. We worked with a vendor, Epoch, who created a database of all machine learning systems since the 1950s. And you can see from this chart over time, the number of parameters um, and data used to train these models have been increasing exponentially. And the source of those models have slowly transitioned from academia, the blue dots, to industry, the purple dots. And those of you who are interested in kind of AI history, the dot all the way over on the left side is the Samuels Checker player, kind of the first well-known AI system. We also have been finding through our work with the index over the past few years that uh, these AI benchmarks are getting saturated. So a benchmark is kind of like a goal for researchers and AI developers to try to hit, for example, image generation. You have a data set of images. Researchers build algorithms tested against these images, trying to um, better uh, identify the images. The blue, each bar on this chart is a different type of benchmark. Um, there's question answering, again, image, language. Um, and then the blue is the overall improvement over time. The purple is the year-over-year -year improvement. So uh, a good amount of these benchmarks are hitting 80 90% um, in their performance. And there's a lot that just have a little bit of purple, meaning there's just not much more room to grow and improve against these benchmarks. Um, there are researchers and research going on out there to create more difficult benchmarks or more benchmarks that incorporate more aspects. So a lot of benchmarks previously just looked at language, just looked at image, just looked at um, a certain question answering data set. We're now trying to create benchmarks that look at image, language um, together or looking at not just the accuracy, but also is there toxicity, is there bias? et cetera, and, and building that all into one benchmark to more holistically evaluate how these models are performing over time. Um, so with this advance, I, my personal opinion, some of the most exciting work is in the field of science. So over the past, in, in 20, yeah, over the past few years, um, there's been a lot of, of progress using AI kind of to complement science. We see AlphaFold, um, where they use reinforcement learning to predict the 3D structure of proteins, which previously would take a PhD student their entire PhD to kind of figure out just one. Um, this system has been able to determine all known proteins. Um, there is also matrix multiplication. So there's a reinforcement learning algorithm that was able to more, uh, find a more efficient way to multiply two matrices or strings of numbers um, and then again, a, a bit of history is this, this problem of matrix multiplication has been looked at for over 50 years where mathematicians have been trying to find a more effective and efficient way to multiply matrices and, and the algorithm was able to do that. Um, so there's a lot of exciting progress being made in the field of science. That one. Um, and then also the environment. So Be Cooler was an experiment on a data center to use, again, reinforcement learning to look at kind of different factors in that data center. Um, and see if they could help reduce the energy usage. And over time, it was able to more efficiently um, use energy. But um, there is a lot of excitement. There is also concerns. So on the subject of environment, there's a study out from a group in Europe that looked at how much CO2 was used to train um, Bloom, 176 billion parameter model. Um, and this chart, you can see Bloom kind of in the middle there in blue, um, and it used about as much energy as the average American life. Um, but you can see kind of that top chart, GPT-3, which is used significantly more and, and not as large of a model or about similar size. The number of incidents concerning AI misuse is also increasing over time. Um, and, and the bias in these systems are well known. So we prompted Midjourney to come up with uh, an image of an influ influential or an intelligent person. 
Um, and as you can see in these pictures, most of those people are um, older white male. So um, we also looked at stable diffusion where you can put in different, um, you have a little bit more options. So we put in attributes that are more stereotypically female. So um, assertive might be a more stereotypical male. Um, and still, most of, the, most of the pictures are men. And then finally, where these AI systems are getting developed, um, mostly in the US, EU, Canada, or China, which then they get used around the globe. Um, we talk about at HAI how when you build these systems, certain cultures and norms are built into them. So then when everyone around the world uses them, are we exporting certain cultures and certain norms? Is that okay? Is that what we want to do? Um, and how do we think about perhaps adjusting that when you go to McDonald's in another country, there's slightly different things on the menu. Um, do we want to think about this in a slightly different way? Um, and then I will pass it over to Russell to give industry. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, so trend number two, uh, industry is racing ahead of academia. This is gonna be a point of focus, hopefully in discussion as well. It's a really key, interesting part. This isn't in the report, but to note that uh, AI has historically been a very academically driven field and has changed in the last few years. So 82% of algorithms in use today actually came from federally funded uh, academic research. And so you'll see a dramatic change here. So industry dominates new significant systems. So in 2022, there were 32 industry uh, significant breakthroughs and three in academia. So note in 2014, that's when you see uh, uh, industry notices uh, th this huge significant trend and a big part of this will be the uh, where they start to throw heavy compute at some of these uh, problems. And this is where you just see industry take away and take off with this. So uh, large language models are getting bigger and more expensive. I think we're kind of hearing a lot more about this as it's starting to break into the news more. So the largest models cost in the, mil in the millions of dollars, which puts them out of reach for a lot of academic groups. But there is much more work going on to reduce the cost of new models, including some recent work we did at Stanford of trying to build on to existing models. Uh, that's uh, Alpaca, one of um, our models that we released. Uh, the costs are still within reach, uh, but not nearly to what uh, uh, tech companies are uh, pulling away with on this. Um, we're seeing the release of uh, special purpose models targeted uh, at particular domains such as finance and bioscience. And so uh, this is a, just a continuation of this. So the largest models uh, cost in millions of dollars, uh, excuse me, I'm a little off on my notes here. Uh, on this, this is where they're getting bigger, more expensive, and we uh, do a, a plot and uh, dock that specifically. In uh, 2011, uh, uh, in 2011, academia and industry hired about the same number of PhDs. Now, uh, in, uh, industry hires about two times more that of what goes into academia. And then uh, trend number three, everybody in industry is, uh, everybody is paying attention to AI right now, whether that's industry, law, and public. And uh, I think what you kind of have right now is this public awakening of AI that we're seeing. So uh, we have um, a growing demand for AI-related skills across virtually uh, uh, every American industrial sector. So uh, the proportion of all job postings that relate to AI, AI is up uh, from 1.7% to 1.9% year over year. And the sectors showing the highest demand are information, professional, scientific, and technical services finance and, uh, and insurance and manufacturing. So for the first time in the last de decade, uh, private investment in AI actually decreased a little bit. So 2022 was the first year in a decade when private investment decreased by, uh, 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 decreased just a tad. 
You have, uh, in 2021, though, a significant uh, portion and a high scale of investment. And uh, still, this is overall uh, an 18 uh, times increase since 2013. The U.S. continues to lead in private investment. Uh, in 2022, the U.S. invested 3.5 uh, times what China did. Uh, again, we'll just note this is private investment. This isn't any other uh, levels of public sector investment. In 2022, the focus area with the most investment was medical uh, and healthcare at 6.1 billion, followed by data management processing and cloud uh, services at 5.9 billion, and then FinTech at about 5.5 billion. So, uh, companies, uh, are, uh, companies report using AI to reduce cost and to increase revenues, and um, we're starting to see uh, cost decreases and revenue increases from AI adoption uh, by specific function. So uh, on this side, there's recent legislation from a variety of states that you're starting to see this, and I think this is really important because you're starting to see a lot of possible, you know, everyone notes that uh, states are the incubators of democracy. So we're starting to see lots of states test out a variety of things. One area uh, is facial recognition um, and uh, development of mixed reality classrooms in California, uh, applications for climate change, providing government services, uh, and codes of ethics. So we, uh, a lot of states are starting to experiment more on uh, policy interventions related to AI. The legal world's waking up. So the AI index uh, started investigating the prominence of legal cases uh, to, uh, related to AI in the US, and we found over 100 such cases in 2022, which is up six times since 2016. And this is a really interesting slide. So it's essentially the perceptions that people have related to AI. So uh, uh, Gallup found a negative uh, worldwide opinion of the safety of self-driving cars, with two-thirds of respondents saying they uh, would not feel safe. Uh, there's also a huge difference between uh, the US and China in this case. China feels much more comfortable with the adoption of AI uh, from public opinion reporting, whereas the US does not. And so uh, I'm a little off on that, on the slide for self-driving cars, excuse me. Uh, but what you do see here is 65% uh, would not feel safe in a self-driving car, and 27% uh, would feel safe in a self-driving car. So uh, we, there is a growing concern about jobs and privacy. Uh, one, uh, one big area is Americans are concerned about uh, AI in uh, loss of human jobs, sur uh, surveillance, hacking, digital privacy, and a uh, lack of, um, a, a, I'm sorry, I can't read this, and my notes are off, uh, lack of uh, uh, human connection. And so this concludes the report, and um, for this, we, I, I just want to thank uh, Nestor Mosley, who's here, who does a, just a true hero of this r report, Laura Donna, Daniel Zhang, and uh, thank you to AEI to let us uh, have the opportunity to present this report. I think Eric's now going to give you some uh, economic uh, aspects on this. Okay. Thank you. So there's a ton of information there, and as uh, Vanessa said, there's a, another couple of hundred pages we can dive into. What I thought I'd do is try to give you a little context and some themes, some highlights, some aspects of the technology, and also as uh, Russell said the economic implications, including the, the thing that was the top of that list of, of concerns about what's happening to work and employment. Um, so um, I'll talk about that a bit. Uh, let me first uh, come to, to one of the first things that was in one of Vanessa's charts, which was uh, the progress on some of the technical benchmarks. And here's another way of looking at it, uh, the progress in uh, uh, image recognition, although not so much progress in formatting letter words like human and machine there. Um, but um, so one of the ways that we've been measuring the progress on that is through this data set called ImageNet that uh, Fei-Fei Li, one of the co-directors of uh, Hai, put together, 14 million images. And uh, as you can see, in 2010, uh, they weren't all that good at it. There was this inflection point 
in 2012 when Jeff Hinton and his team uh, introduced deep neural nets. And uh, people hadn't been using them for this purpose or many other purposes until then. And once he showed that you could get this big improvement, everybody switched to using it. And very quickly, that became the approach not only for ImageNet, but for a whole set of other kinds of applications. And part of the excitement over the past decade in AI has really been around machine learning, specific around deep learning. Um, I also kind of, for interest, put a, a, the red line there about the progress uh, in humans in recognizing images, which hasn't been nearly as steep. Um, and uh, at some point, the machines get better than humans. And if you think about it from the perspective of an economist or a policymaker or, or an entrepreneur or manager, when a machine can do a task better than a human and more cheaply, more efficiently, more accurately, then you're going to switch over who you have doing that task. And that's happening not only with image recognition, but in many, many other kinds of tasks. So we're having some economic change that's being driven by these changes. Um, and it's uh, for deep learning, traditional machine learning systems, there's a whole class of uh, applications where this works very well. And that is where you have a lot of uh, data on inputs and a lot of data on outputs. And you can therefore let the machine do the mapping from one to the other. You don't need to have a human understand the relationships. Maybe I don't exactly know how to write code that would explain how to recognize my mother's face. That might be uh, a lot of tacit knowledge there. But if you give it enough examples of faces, machines can figure out how to make that kind of a mapping. And right now, the past several years, there's been a gold rush going on with companies rushing to take advantage of these technologies to do more and more applications. Every significant company has a big operation to try to figure out how they can use machine learning techniques to uh, up, uh, handle many of their core uh, processes. Um, the past couple, past uh, year or so, especially the past few months, there's been an even bigger surge of interest around foundation models, generative AI, large language models, and the broader class. Here's uh, the latest set of logos. I have to update this slide every few weeks because there's just more and more companies uh, rushing into this space with more and more capabilities. If you read Archive or some of the papers, the, the, the sets of papers, there are breakthroughs almost uh, every day. Uh, yesterday, Google made a whole other set of announcements at, at Google I.O. Um, and that has uh, created a lot of excitement about these capabilities of, of particularly generative AI and especially around language. But it's much broader than that, as this side, slide shows. Um, one thing that, has, that came after our, our report was completed um, was progress on a set of benchmarks of GPT-4, uh, the successor to GPT-3. And here's a, a paper from Eric Horvitz and, and his colleagues um, called uh, Sparks of Artificial General Intelligence, showing that on a whole set of different benchmarks, these systems are now getting at or above human level. Um, I'll draw your attention, for instance, to the one that's labeled um, uh, Uniform Bar Exam, um, which is now above 90%. Um, and the humans who take that exam apparently fail about 40% of the time. So uh, this is doing quite well on that, doing quite well on all these other exams. Uh, the, um, I don't think that passing the bar exam is equivalent to being a lawyer, um, or passing the other exams is equivalent to being a doctor or some of the other things. Um, but it is a metric of it. And in some ways, actually, I think the, uh, the systems do better than lawyers in some of the, the contract, and they draw on all, the, all sorts of information. So we are seeing sparks of artificial general intelligence in more and more areas. And that's going to clearly have some big implications for the way work is done. It's already having some implications. And uh, I had a paper come out a couple weeks ago I'll talk about that showed how it's changing productivity and performance in different areas. Um, so one way to assess that is to look at all the tasks that we humans currently do. Uh, there's a data set of that called ONET that many of you may be familiar with. Uh, there's other ways of measuring it, but this is one particular way. And it catalogs about 18,000 distinct tasks. And with Tom Mitchell, we came up with a, a set of criteria for what machines can currently do well and what machines don't do well. They don't do everything, um, and particularly what machine learning can do well. And we applied it to each of those tasks. And um, for instance, here's a set of tasks that radiologists do. And as Jeff Hinton pointed out uh, a few years ago, machines have gotten very good at doing medical images. And he said, we should stop training radiologists, because now machines can do that. 
Um, and, and he was right about the machines being quite good at that particular task. But according to ONET, there are 27 tasks that radiologists do. And the machines aren't that good at many of the other ones. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily want them to administer conscious sedation to you or to consult with uh, the other doctors or to uh, uh, give you, you know, console you when, when you get a, your, your uh, image read back to you. So there's a whole set of things that machines are, are still not ready to do. And this was the pattern we saw in all of the different uh, occupations we looked at. We didn't see a single one where machine learning or any other technologies we looked at ran the table and was able to do everything. We saw many, in fact, the vast majority of them, where machine learning could do some of the very important tasks that were being done. So my takeaway is that we're not imminently facing complete elimination of whole categories of work, but we are seeing major restructuring of work and reorganization as parts of them can now be done better by machines. Um, and that's a pretty big number. If you just look at the ones, the, the very, the 90 percentile, the ones that they're most suitable for, um, that's already $700 billion of uh, work that could be done uh, better by machines than humans. So it's, it's a pretty big impact. It's not evenly distributed throughout the economy. Um, here's a scatter plot of those 950 occupations. The horizontal axis is the um, wages that are paid to them. The vertical axis is how suitable they are for machine learning. And what you can see is that there are some occupations like cashiers that are relatively low paid and a lot of their work could be done by machines. And many cashiers are, are close to having their entire jobs being replaced, as many of you, I'm sure, are using self-checkouts. Um, there are some jobs that are fairly high paid, like pilots, where a big percentage of them can also be done by machines. There may be cultural, legal, regulatory reasons why they aren't. But in terms of the, just looking at the, the technical capabilities, machines could do a lot of those. I know you guys are all wondering, where are economists? There's economists. <laughs> um, so I know you're thinking, that's not paid as high as they should be. Um, but um, but um, so that's with, with machine learning. We wrote that paper a few years ago, and that's with the wave up before foundation models, before generative AI. Um, now with generative AI, the patterns, oh, the other thing I should mention here is that, that you can clearly see is there's a downward slope there, that on average, the low, lower paid tasks were somewhat more likely to be suitable for machine learning. Well, there's, a, there's some all over the place there. Um, with the latest wave of large language models, uh, one of my uh, former students, Daniel Rock, who's now at Wharton, worked with a team of uh, people at OpenAI, and uh, they looked at very, very similar methodology, but now using large language models, or particularly GPTs, to see where they could affect work. And now the pattern's the other way around. And now, as you see, it's upward sloping. Uh, the higher paid jobs are somewhat more likely to be affected. Actually, sort of the middle professional jobs are most likely to be affected, like the doctors and lawyers that I mentioned before. Uh, less, lower paid jobs are less likely to be affected. So we have a little bit of a, a flip around from what we saw with the last wave of machine learning. There's no economic law that um, IT or digital technologies or any technology is always going to increase inequality. In this case, it may uh, reduce inequality in some ways. Um, that was a sort of theoretical exercise that they did. Uh, I just had a paper come out uh, uh, about two weeks ago um, looking at a real implementation of these models at a call center. And the first thing to take away was just there's enormous productivity effect. The blue is with the machine learning system, and the, the red and green were without it. And you see there's a big shift um, of improvement, either in, in less handle time or more resolutions per hour, more chats per hour. Also, customer sentiment up. They went up. There were more happy words and fewer angry words in the, in the chats. Um, uh, turnover among the call center agents went down. They seemed to be more happy there. Uh, the managers were called on about 25% less. So just basically every metric we looked at improved. Interestingly, the biggest improvements were for the less skilled workers. Uh, they had about a 30% improvement. The most skilled workers had a very little improvement. The average was about 14%. Um, so. Um, it was definitely a, a technology, as the theory had predicted, that helps the less skilled workers somewhat more. Um, we also think that this may trickle up to the entire economy and have some big impacts. I had a paper come out uh, yesterday uh, with a couple of people from the building next door um, who uh, we, we looked at how much of an effect could this have on productivity over the coming decade. And we think that it could get us back to the numbers we had like in the, in the 1990s, more, more or less doubling the productivity growth we have currently up into the 3% or more range. 
uh, because of examples like the one I just showed you at the call center, but also affecting all of those other areas. Now, it takes a while for that to work its way through, um, but we think it's going to be somewhat faster this time around than it was with some of the earlier waves because the infrastructure is already in place. Many of you, how many of you have already used ChatGPT? Better see all the hands go up. Yeah, if your hand isn't up, it should be. Um, and so that just shows you how quickly and easily this technology can diffuse. It went from zero to 100 million users in two months because we already have a lot of the infrastructure. And with Google's announcement yesterday and Microsoft's coming out, it'll be integrated into a lot of the tools that we use in our daily lives. So that will speed the productivity impacts significantly. Um, there's a whole set of policy recommendations we can get into, but I think in the interest of time, um, I want to get to your questions and comments. So if you want to talk about these, we can talk about them, um, or we can talk about other issues that you may want to uh, touch on. Thanks very much. Well, so uh, thank you all. Um, there's a, a lot of substance that we can dive into, both in the report and, and the, the paper that you were uh, citing, Eric. Um, I thought maybe to start, it'd be helpful to just sort of, uh, in terms of the lay of the land of AI and thinking about the findings of the report, um, I wanted to highlight a few findings that jumped out at me and maybe have you say a little bit more about them. So the decrease in investment um, in AI, I think might come as a surprise to a lot of people given the fact that AI is the thing that everyone's talking about right now. Um, and similarly, the benchmark saturation. Um, so maybe to start, uh, Vanessa, you could say a little bit more about each of those and what we're supposed to, how, how, we, should, how we should interpret them. Yeah, um, so regarding the investment, I, agree. I, I was surprised by that. I think that, I personally think that it might be a blip, like perhaps 2021 was just extra special and now we are seeing some differences in the economy. But if you look back 10 years, like the trend is still going up and it will be really interesting to see what that chart looks like in the next report. Um, and then as far as, yeah, benchmark saturation. So this one is interesting, right? Like a lot of these benchmarks, we, we create a benchmark and it's a goal to reach. Um, a lot of the benchmarks are getting saturated or reaching those goals there, as Eric showed for ImageNet, like above human performance. Um, but we do, there are still a lot of, you know, the, the AI technology isn't exactly as we would want it to act. Like there are still um, limitations. So I do think it's a, a good opportunity to rethink how we define these benchmarks at, based on how we want to use these technologies. Um, and think of, again, a more holistic approach to what a benchmark is versus historically they've been relatively narrow. Mm -hmm. yes, and, say, yeah, so, sure, absolutely. So, I mean, this was when we created the AI index. I mean, so Yoav Shalom and I got together uh, like five or six years ago to, to create it. And our, our vision was Moore's Law. Like, well, how could we do that for AI? Just sort of keep track of mm -hmm. how things were progressing. The thing that we discovered quickly, which was sort of paradoxical, was that so many of the AI benchmarks they just max them out. Like you can't get above 100% on ImageNet. I mean, that's the, that's the max. Um, and it, part of that reflects just that the very rapid progress in a lot of categories of AI. Um, uh, part of it also reflects the fact that um, when you set a specific goal, it's remarkable how good AI researchers are at hitting that particular goal. And then we have to constantly invent new goals and, and move it. So, the saturation, I don't, you shouldn't interpret it as like, oh, we're running out of things to do. It's more that the, the specific goals that were set, we hit those, and now people constantly have to come up with new, new benchmarks going forward. Mm -hmm. And if researchers, if that's, you know, if that's what incentivizes them to, to make progress in these technologies, it's even more important for us to think critically about what these benchmarks should be so that the research is going in that direction. That's a really important point. Um, and maybe all of you can help us. We are working on trying to come up with new benchmarks now because of the power of these uh, benchmarks. And for instance, one of them is to think about how we can use uh, technology to cooperate with humans as opposed to replace humans. Um, and there are other benchmarks. And if you guys have thoughts about what you'd like to see AI do, because um, you know, if, if you set a particular target, um, it's remarkable how effective they may be at, at hitting those. So we need to to steer technology in the right directions. I, I want to come back to the issue of uh, complementing humans. 
Um, but before doing that, so uh, thinking about the report, uh, another finding, well, really two that jumped out at me, um, and I'm not sure that they were both on the slides, but uh, one had to do with the, uh, the uptick in uh, demand for AI-related skills in different sectors, which I think is something that we all probably are aware of. But simultaneously with that, the actual uptake of AI didn't see, seem to plateau, I think is that, if I remember correctly. It seemed like there was a bit of a disconnect between the use of the technology and the demand for the skills. And I'm wondering how to make sense of those two things. Well, why don't you get, well how about Russ? I think that there's a part of the overall, at times, the adoption and the rate as to which people are start, starting to accept a lot of the technology. And so it's kind of an interesting dynamic right now. Uh, if, you t if we talked about we were on the stage a year ago, it would have been a very fundamentally different conversation, yeah. probably not as crowded of a room. And I think over time you're starting to see now what is it this integration side within industry and how are they starting to adopt this? So right now, for example, ChatGPT, people are starting to use it more broadly and they're starting to understand the technology more. My expectation is I think you'll probably see more of a hockey stick style from this now that people know it's more readily available to them in some capacity. Mm -hmm. My mic or not. One of us is feeding back. Um, so it, presumably part of this would be the, uh, uh, the, the gains that those industries that are taking it up are seeing will uh, presumably have some impact on Right, and Perfect. Eric has this, uh, that NBER paper that just re recently came out that showed a 30% increase in productivity from a call center using ChatGPT. And in that sense, if you look at it, if you start seeing these continual gains, your other industries are going to be forced or compelled to start to rely on this technology. So uh, I want to get into some of the spe specifics about, um, especially the generative AI, um, questions about uh, augmenting humans, replacing humans. Maybe before doing that, um, I think it would be helpful to kind of get a definition of foundation models on the table for everyone. Um, everyone's talking about ChatGPT and all these, these uh, new tools. Um, and if I'm correct, high was the place where the, the term mm -hmm. foundation model was coined. So perhaps from the, the horse's mouth, we should get a sure. definition. Sure. And, what, and what's particularly distinctive about them? I, I, I can think, so, um, there's a lot of terms that are sort of overlapping in Venn diagram, think about it, there's generative AI, there's large language models, there's foundation models, and um, Percy Liang, who's the director of the Center for Research and Foundation Models, is an office next to us here at, at, at part of, and he's a director of HI, um, uh, we basically sat around and brainstormed different names, and we, we came up with like a dozens of different names for this phenomenon that was happening. Generative AI we thought was a little too narrow because you could have a very small system that generates content. Uh, large language models was too specific because as you guys know, they can do images, video, um, uh, audio, lots of different kinds, even proteins. And, um, and so the, the name we came up with was foundation models because basically what, what they, the way they work is you train them on this corpus of data like language or other things and then you can build things on top of them and you don't have to uh, start from scratch each time. That can be used in lots of different ways for lots of different kinds of applications. So it's a foundation for other things on top of it. It's not like the, the ultimate answer, but it's a foundation for additional kinds of work. And it's meant to be broader than just language models or generative AI or those other categories. And so I, I would just yeah, add, one, sure. add one more point to that. And Eric's captured that to some extent, but I think you're starting to see more and the broadening of these models to be multimodal. And that's a really, really key concept in these because they're gonna be able to do many different types of things versus just that narrow one area that they can do. Yeah, so I, I, thinking about these, these models, um, I think, you know, the question that comes immediately to mind is you know, what will be distinctive about them in terms of their impact? And so, you know, I, there's, um, been a lot of research done over the years on the impacts of different kinds of technologies on workforce, um, contributing to the inequality that we've seen in the, in the workforce. Um, is, are, how should we think about these foundation models in terms of their workforce impacts? Not just in terms of productivity gains, but kind of differential impacts of different aspects. So my view is that this is a really staggeringly important technology. It's a pity there's so much buzz around crypto and, and 
uh, I don't know, uh, 3D printing others that people thought, th this one, uh, I always thought those were a little overhyped. I think this one, despite all the attention, maybe in some ways is underhyped. Um, I think the effect on productivity, as, as I've said, is going to be quite large, like um, perhaps doubling what it was, much more optimistic than the Congressional Budget Office or others. Um, because of its potential, we're already seeing that happen faster than expected. The effect on the workforce is also going to be quite profound, I think, in many ways, bigger than what we saw, with, say, with the pandemic, spread out over more time, but more lasting and more profound than the remote work types of changes. I think it's, it's uh, bigger than what we saw with the previous wave of machine learning. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a big deal. And the striking thing is it's far from over. Like every week I see another breakthrough. So this is not like a one-time discovery or invention. This is a set of ongoing capabilities. In fact, currently there's just a lot of what they call capabilities overhang. The people who develop these models are often surprised that they're able to do new things that they didn't expect to do, they didn't train it to do. So they're discovering things that, it's not usually a technology doesn't quite do what you hoped it would do. These technologies are doing more than what they asked it to do. So they trained it to, to understand language, and then they found out by accident that it can also do coding, it can write Python, which is super valuable. 30% of the code at OpenAI is now written with the help of, of, uh, of their uh, coding tool that's based on GPT. Uh, it can translate languages without even seeing, without even having a matching between the two languages. Normally, the way machine learning models work is you have you know, uh, French and English, and then and you have uh, text that's identical, so you can compare them. This was able to do it from uh, Bengali and other languages that it didn't even have any matching languages. So there's just these weird capabilities um, emergent behavior that continue to be discovered. So I'm, I'm, uh, 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 I'm expecting even more interesting things in the pipeline. So following up on that, I, you've also made this argument, Eric, about the, the Turing trap, mm -hmm. um, the idea of how you explain it. But I think uh, clearly on everyone's minds, and you can see this in the survey data from the mm -hmm. report, is the possibility of, of replacing humans. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think about the, those sets of problems. What, what is the Turing trap? How yeah. do these new models fit into it? And should people be worried about this? Well, since the beginning of AI, there have been these two philosophies of AI. Alan Turing had this amazing concept of the Turing test that most of you, you may know, which is, can we make a machine that is so similar to a human that you can't tell which is which? Uh, it was based on something called the imitation game. If you make a, a machine that is indistinguishable from a human, then it has you know, passed the Turing test. It is truly intelligent. And that's a vision of having machines match and imitate humans. Very compelling. A lot of people are working on different versions of achieving that. There's been another philosophy, which is how can we make machines augment humans and add to it? And Douglas Emmelgobarts and others have talked about it. Aug augmented intelligence you know, uh, instead of uh, uh, artificial intelligence. And um, uh, that ultimately, I think, has even more potential because it doesn't simply get us to match what we're already doing, but it gets us to go beyond what we're already doing. Let me give you a little thought experiment that I wrote about in that, in that paper, The Turing Trap, uh, which is um, so, suppo Daedalus was supposedly this uh, mythical uh, engineer 2,500 years ago uh, that made robots, according to legend. And suppose he had really succeeded in making robots according to Alan Turing's prescription of getting them to do all the things that humans were doing back then. So he looked around and you know, he would get robots to make clay pots, to make tunics, to fix chariots. If you were sick, no problem, it would burn incense for you. It would do all the things that people were doing back then. And that'd be nice because you wouldn't have to work anymore, but you can also see very quickly that our living standards wouldn't be all that much better. You know, there'd be no uh, no new stuff. There would be no uh, iPhones or mRNA vaccines or jet planes. Most of our rise in living standards comes from doing new things that we never did before. And likewise, if we were to automate just the things we were doing now, it's not a bad thing, but it's really limiting what you could do. The reason I call it the Turing trap is because it's worse than that. It's not just that it doesn't raise the ceiling as much. It also can lead to a bad allocation. If technology substitutes or imitates what humans are doing, then it tends to reduce the value of labor, possibly to zero, and increase the value of capital or technology. So it shifts 
the existing pie around. Uh, labor income tends to be much more widely distributed, so it leads to a more of a concentration of wealth and power. So not only do you have less of a ceiling, but you also have more of a concentration of wealth and probably political power. And uh, for that reason, I think that we uh, would be better off thinking more about ways of augmenting intelligence and not merely automating. I'm not, I'm not saying it's bad to always, to, to, you know, that we should never uh, automate things. There are many places where it could be, but right now there's an overemphasis on that. And, and one of my slides had uh, you know, the tax code right now favors uh, doing things with capital rather than labor. And things like the X tax that uh, um, AI has pioneered would have it be much more equal. Can I so, will say? Oh, yeah, go right ahead. Um, your question about you kind know, of how this is going to impact all of our lives. I, I mean, I think that the verdict is still out. Like all of these things are new. We're still figuring out how to use them. I, one of our researchers mentioned it's kind of like they're getting airdropped on us, and we like don't really know what to do. But it is time for us. Like I mean, you all are here. You're engaged in the topic, but more, we need more voices, more people engaged, helping to define what's going to happen. There's a lot of opportunity, there's risks, and we need to, to figure out how to balance both. Yeah, so staying on the opportunity part, and before getting into the, you know, the, the, the downsides, and maybe a little bit more about human re replacement, um, one of the, the slides that really jumped out at me in, um, in your presentation was the impact of AI, particularly these foundation models on scientific discovery and scientific mm -hmm. research. Yeah. Um, there's been a lot of discussion, at least among us science policy nerds about the issues of productivity in science, sort of related to but distinguishable from the broader question of technological productivity. Um, could you say more about that, the impact of, of AI on science and what, what the consequences might be? Yeah, I mean, you know, these scientific discoveries have, have broad impacts on society. So, you know, Eric looks at labor and productivity, but if, if we can create initial scientific discovery, then then the conversation, you know, it changes. It, the internet scientific discovery, it, it was developed in a lab, and then there's a lot of, um, you know, it changed all of our lives. So um, these things are kind of, I, I think, in the realm of do the technology doing what humans can't do, which creates kind of that that extra bump in the in the opportunity. So if I could add on that, there's, I think, a degree of a multiplier effect that can come from the scientific discovery of some of these things. So uh, if somebody, there's a mathematician that's been studying a mathematical problem for 50 years, expects to leave their work behind for someone else to solve it 50 years from then, um, but instead AI now is solving it tomorrow, that ha will have fundamental changes, I think, of new knowledge that's going to open up for uh, a lot of humanity. And I think it's gonna be very, very powerful what ultimately comes from science. Mm. So, yeah, bring it back yeah. to the productivity gains yeah. that I'm seeing. I mean, part of it would be that one-time boost that we talked about where you can call centers, lawyers, et cetera. But the more exciting thing is, as, as Vanessa was touching on, if we can increase the rate of scientific discovery and, and TFP growth, then we're going to see a compounding of faster growth in each future year as well. And I see AI is very much a tool for turbocharging that kind of innovation. So to put it, you know, in simplest terms possible, it could be a solution to the productivity problems that people have been worrying I think so. About. And without, you know, as, as this audience all knows, productivity unlocks so many things. If you want to address the budget deficit or health care or military or environment, all these things, it's so much easier if you have better productivity growth. So thinking about sort of pivoting to the, the negative side, the downsides, um, it was striking to me that um, in the survey data, the, uh, the issues that people cared most about didn't necessarily match all with what issues uh, people in policy land are necessarily talking about. The exception maybe of the human replacement issue, which I think everybody's focused on. So I guess a sort of general question really for any of you, um, what other kinds of risks and harms should we be thinking about uh, in the context, especially of these foundation models? And then the you know harder follow on question is what, what we should do in terms of policy interventions to think about. Everyone's looking at me. Uh, <laughs> I, I would say one, I, one thing is there are risks, and I'll get into that in a second, but what's really interesting is we're not set up, I think, uh, from a policy perspective or governance perspective for some of those risks. A good example of this is credit decisions. So uh, what we see is uh, racial disparities that can come from AI and problems of uh, 
what, what per, certain uh, minorities being uh, affected or, or disproportionately affected here. But one interesting thing is, is in our, in our banking laws, we don't collect racial data to the same extent. So it's really difficult to go back and see if some of these systems are actually potentially denying people credit in certain decisions because we don't have the means to be able to collect that type of data. So I think that there's a lot of policy aspects that we're going to have to think about and how we refashion and essentially make ourselves equipped to be able to look at some of these types of risks. Um, but the risks are extensive. They can be, uh, uh, they can affect uh, particularly people in, with biased data sets, and that's what we're really concerned about. And I would say too, that for me, there's like this feeling of um, you don't know what you don't know. Like when social media came out, we did not know some of the implications of that once it was rolled out into the broader society. So, and right now, you know, OpenAI is releasing ChatGPT. It basically all of us are the testers. Um, so I, I do think we could probably think about better ways to apply the scientific method and, and study the effects of these tools on society before re releasing them. Um, just because, yeah, I have a hard time like saying what all the harms are because I don't know what I don't know. And, yeah. I think there's at least three big classes of harms that um, concern me if you make a longer list. But one is around the economic ones that you mentioned, uh, effect on work and, and just because it increases productivity doesn't mean that everybody gains or some people can be made worse off. And we want to think about the, the winners and losers uh, and what happened with uh, globalization and free trade is a good example that economists say, hey, makes the pie bigger. There'll be winners and losers, but we'll compensate them. And so everybody will come out ahead. Um, we didn't do the second part of that. And there's a big backlash. Um, so I worry that we'll get it wrong again. This will be even a bigger shock. The second one is around misinformation, which includes um, you know, social media and what may happen with democracy, but also in the individual level, uh, phishing attacks, deep fakes. It's going to be hard when somebody calls you up or even if you have a video with them to know, is this, you know, really your brother or not? Is it, or, you know, it's somebody just imitating a machine imitating it. And we'll need to address a whole set of uh, risks that are emerging as language models become much, much better and foundation models become much, much better. And the third one that I don't dismiss is the existential risk kind of uh, really serious. Uh, will we create machines that we don't know how to control well enough? And I, I hope it's a small chance, but it's one that I, I think we shouldn't just dismiss out of hand and have some work on it. Uh, there are a lot of things we can do to address it. We, we can talk more about. But one of the categories that I'd like to see us do a better job is just, just measuring the, you know, the effects a little bit better and having a better policy framework for um, tracking what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so sticking with the sort of the harms related to workforce, the sort of downsides, mm -hmm. um, we, how would you, how do you think about the impact of foundation models? So, you know, one of the things you've described is the potential to use AI and other kinds of technologies to augment in a complementary mm -hmm. way mm -hmm. rather than replacement. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, clearly an issue that, that uh, worries a lot of people. Right. Um, is there something about foundation models that makes you know, replacement more likely or augmentation more likely? Or is this something that uh, sort of lives the level of human choice and implementation of these technologies? So at what point can and should we intervene in order to ensure we don't have the replacement scenario that people are worried about? Um, so yeah, yeah, I do think there are some things that make, uh, that, make that question especially salient for Foundation models are much more powerful. Um, I do think we have some choices. Um, so let me dive into each of those a little bit more. Um, in, in terms, uh, those of you who work with, with large language models or chat GPT, you know that it's incredibly powerful and do a lot of things, but it also can make some incredibly boneheaded mistakes. It can hallucinate, as the technologists call it. It can create answers that seem very plausible on the surface, but are just, just wrong. If you ask it to to, to uh, help me with an essay, it'll give me some references that look very promising. Then when I click on the references and I look them up, it turns out it just fabricated them. Um, but they look really like, right, they have the right authors, the right titles, the right journals. Um, and that can be very harmful. If you're a doctor or a lawyer or even in a call center, you know, it could be a big problem if you're just making stuff up. Um, for some, some, some professions, I guess it's less important. Um, so, um, Don't look at me. <laughs> No, not you. Uh, so, um, 
for that reason, I think it's very important to keep humans in the loop uh, with the current technology. I wouldn't trust it to, to make the final call in, in most categories. I would like to have a real doctor or a human doctor or a, a human lawyer or a human call center operator. That operation, you know, they did not try to have a, the uh, language model respond directly to the um, customers. They had it coach a human call center operator and basically help them. And I think that's a, a model where it works really well. I don't think enough managers understand that, maybe not enough technologists or policymakers. And so there's very much this mindset of the Turing test of let's make it replace this person. But they'll have more success if they think about it more in terms of coordinating and, and overcome some of the data, not eliminate them, because um, humans make mistakes too. But you put the two in combination, and you do a lot better than either of them does separately. So I want to. I want to pivot now back to the, um, the sort of things that we can do in response in terms of policy, particularly in the public sector. Um, you know, I guess there are two things that, that really jump out at me here. One is that you know, we've all talked about how quickly things are changing. Mm -hmm. And Washington's not known for moving very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of uh, people in the pol tech policy world have talked about the pacing problem, the difficulty of mm -hmm. uh, public sector responding with meaningful policy mm -hmm. to technology that's just moving so rapidly. And then a related piece is the sort of expert capacity and other sorts of in institutional infrastructural capacities that the public sector might have or might not have that would allow it to deal with these questions. So I guess you know, one first question um, for you, Russell, thinking about um, particularly this uh, increasing prominence of the private sector and um, AI research, what, what role do you see for the federal government? What, what are, where are the places where you know, reform might be necessary? What, what's what needs to happen in order to have meaningful policy here? Yeah, so I'm talking to a lot of policymakers of late, uh, recently, just who are very interested in the topic. And I think a lot of their constituents are pushing them and rattling their cages a bit because there's almost a degree of hysteria as to how fast this has moved. But the reality here is, is there, a lot of this is what's coming out of product labs into the hands of, um, the public and they're starting to see this and there's just this unique shift of where we're going quick to regulation and I'm very for regulation in this space but I think even if we had the optimal regulation set up to uh, tomorrow that held industry's feet to the fire uh, but they were still allowed to innovate we wouldn't be able to effectively be able to enforce them because we don't have the talent for this so we need to think more broadly about a national strategy here versus just thinking exclusively of just in a narrow regulatory strategy. And a national strategy to me, for, in no order necessarily a preference, but first is policymaker education. I think policymakers need to be much more informed on this. Um, the second part of this is infrastructure. So there's a lack of infrastructure that's available in particular on the public sector. So there's the National AI Research Resource which we have very much championed, uh, and that would give essentially, uh, the government would subsidize cloud computing uh, uh, or provide some form of compute for academic use, uh, test beds by NIST. So there's a lot of things on the infrastructure side. The third part is talent, making sure that we're doing things to have the proper talent uh, come into government uh, so that people are informed. So one area of that is STEM immigration. A second part with, of this would, could be uh, advancing the Intergovernmental Personnel Act so that people can come in and out of government with the level of expertise that needs to be there. And then finally, it is regulations, but I think that there's a really interesting part on the regulation side. I think first, there will be a need for new novel regulations. Low-hanging fruit on that is uh, some degree of transparency that needs to be applied here uh, for a lot of these models. Uh, but another area is existing regulations, and I do appreciate that the FTC is actually putting out statements or making it well known that there should be a degree of um, enforcement related to um, model, uh, uh, companies or organizations that are put, uh, put, putting something out that are using AI for deceptive practices or that are claiming to use something that's AI that's not related to AI. And they really should put the hammer down on that because we're shaping an ecosystem right now. And as you're shaping an ecosystem, you really want to make sure that there is not an area of where it could slide into the use, nefarious use of this. 
So you, as you create this, you need more of a national strategy that does put more public sector type of resources towards this. So it's not exclusively held by industry. Uh, I, I very much share your concern that the technology is racing ahead and our ability to keep up with it, it, it is not nearly in sync. So our capabilities are way ahead of our wisdom. I mean, so one obvious thing is to invest more in building up our wisdom. But I think we need to be humble that we're never going to totally fully understand some of the implications and it's changing very fast. I was just looking at the pamphlet about Friedrich Hayek in the hallway there. It reminds me that, uh, that there's a lot of local knowledge that businesses, individuals have that we want to try and get them to use it in the right direction. And so rather than legislate specific solutions or try to imagine this technology, this way of doing it, is create some broad incentives to do things or at least not have the incentives to do things the wrong way. So we talked earlier about um, uh, 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 the complements versus substitutes. Right now, there are very strong incentives to replace workers as opposed to treating having a more level playing field. Let, let instead of Congress and everyone else figuring out exactly which technologies implement, let's just have uh, a more uniform treatment of capital and labor or value added, and then, you, then people can make the decisions that are less likely to lead to concentration of wealth and power. Or in the case of uh, misinformation uh, and deception, you know, hold people liable and then they'll figure out ways of avoiding it or reducing it because they will be responsible for those kinds of costs. So those are some ways of using the market and using people's individual knowledge, um, but having uh, the government rather than legislate specific solutions pervade incentives to do things the right way. And I would say too, I mean, there's other mechanisms, kind of to Eric's point, like aside from the federal government, which there, they, there is an important role there, but um, the, the researchers and the, the general public and the, the community needs to come up as well with what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, and, and kind of norms around how, um, what types of data should be included, what should, what should be um, shared when a model is released, uh, how these models should be, how they should be released in general. Yeah, so I think I'll be mindful of time. I want to make sure we get to um, audience questions. It seems like a good opportunity. I'm sure, uh, given the fact that we're in Washington, there'll be lots of uh, questions around these topics. So please feel free to uh, raise your hand. I think we have a, a microphone that will come around. And if you would uh, state your name and affiliation. Uh, I'm told I can take virtual questions as well. So I make sure I have this. Hi, I'm Neil Chilson. I'm with the Center for Growth and Opportunity, and I'm the, the former chief technologist at the Federal Trade Commission. So I appreciate the, the comment uh, about that. Um, so it's my understanding a lot of these large language models and other generative AIs are uh, built on large data sets, which are primarily composed of public information on the internet. And some people have jokingly said, maybe the best thing that'll ever come out of Web 2.0 and social media is uh, enough information to train these models. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if, that's the, if, if that's true, are we, two questions, are, are we running out of data? I mean, uh, um, we don't have that data set anymore, uh, not the same way, it's not growing as fast as it has, it may be collected over time. But then number two, is there any way to sort of correlate um, perhaps the, the potential costs of eliminating or destroying data or not collecting it in the first place, um, which has been a pretty conscious choice of policymakers over the last you know, 10 years, uh, in, in particular in, in privacy law. Um, could we, is there a way to like measure that cost in a way that might help us better understand the trade-offs that we're making when we decide not to collect information? Um, so I'll, I'll take a, I'll so it, it's possible that we'll start running out of data, but I think most people feel like that's, there's at least a couple of paths that will prevent us from being, we're still not quite at the limits of using up what's available, but if, 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 it, if the only path we're just making models bigger and bigger and using existing data, you would get to that point. There are two things that mitigate that quite a bit. One is that apparently you can create synthetic data, which seems like kind of uh, like pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, but there are there are people are using synthetic data. It seems to be working. How far you can push that? Um, but but I've talked to some people that maybe another 10x or something, some enormous improvement from that. The other, in the opposite direction, 
people are finding ways of making training these models with dramatically less data, like very small amounts of data, order, you know, a thousand times less or something, and still quite good. And they seem to be very inefficient the way they're using the data right now. So there's just room for doing so much more. And that second path in particular makes me optimistic that we're probably not going to hit hit those barriers anytime soon. Um, <clears throat> I have actually a dozen questions, but obviously don't have time for all of them. So I'd like to come back to the topology that Eric. Oh, my name is Anupam Khanna, ex World Bank, ex IT industry in India, and now I'm back in this area. Uh, the three risks you mentioned the economic risks, as well as the misinformation, and third one were existential risks. I'd like to start with the third one. So the over the horizon risks based, I attend three seminars at HAI every week, so including yours. But people like Michal Kosinski have talked about the emergent nature mm -hmm. of AI. Mm -hmm. And that he pointed out to a certain number of risks, which are much more, I think, approximate than you know, the AGI. Mm -hmm. Secondly, Jeff Hancock, who's your co-director, mentioned the issue, again, in terms of society and economic organization, of trust. Mm -hmm. And I think in terms of what do you think of those as, we think of them as second order, but one of the things that we should learn from chat GPT is that the second order effects are actually bigger than the first order. Yeah. First question, second question, economic one. You talk about replacement and here all the debate is all about replacement versus uh, augmentation or but really, we need to, once you put geography into it, the political economy changes. Today, for example, the FT is reporting that most accounting firms are going to give up on, you know, because of the problem of accounting workforce in the US and in the West, they're going to move it all out. So the economics of outsourcing, for example, are undergoing dramatic change. And especially in light of what you've discussed, has the flipping of the curves. So, is that really the replacement versus substitution? Is that really a right way to frame the issue? I think you need to think about how the geographic division of labor has changed in this area and is changing. And it comes in, especially in the debate we have about AI and the supply chains and the tech competition between China and the US. I've been focusing much more on China and other developing countries, but I think the problem is much more profound here. I mean, yeah, I, I would say, yes, different geographies are different, and we need to think about how the effects will impact different types of people across all realms. Um, I mean, at HAI, we do truly believe that augmenting is the best approach, um, and that we should be there. We can, things will be better if we can appropriately augment first replace. Replacing won't, won't get us the, the benefits that, that could be seen with the technology. My point is, let me just mention, IT industry in India, half of it is multinational, mm -hmm. right? And most of them up to now, if you had to put them on the job ladder, are in the, you would say at the middle to lower end. Today, according to Eric's latest paper, those are the people which will have the maximum benefit for this type of thing. So the, the rents will change dramatically. And no matter how you split the rent, it has major implications. That's, that's really the crux of the matter. Yeah, I think the geopolitical effects are going to be enormous. And the first thing you said was that it's, it's, there's a lot of uncertainty emergent properties. I think we're still in the first or second inning of a nine inning or more ball game. And so um, every week I see changes. I, I do think that a lot of the folks in, in India and elsewhere that are doing some of the outsourcing are going to be profoundly affected. Whether it's complementing, augmenting, or substituting remains to be determined. There'll probably be some of each. But there are uh, millions of workers in those industries that are going to be massively uh, disrupted one way or the other. And if they can find a way of augmenting themselves, that could be good news. But they may also find that the, the demand uh, doesn't grow as fast as their capabilities. And then there'll be fewer workers doing those sorts of things. So that's, that could uh, really shift things around, as you say. Um, on the earlier point about McCall and the, the, the 
emergent properties, I, I, I agree, there's going to be some unexpected. We didn't anticipate what social media would do in a lot of different ways. Uh, maybe we could have if we thought more carefully. I'm hoping we'll think more carefully. But and he, he, I had him over for dinner uh, a few weeks ago, and we were you know, looking at some of the, the theory of mind that these systems have, where they can uh, uh, anticipate what you think, what Vanessa thinks that Russ may be doing, and like just kind of have different states of mind. And that's really important for like understanding human relations, for persuasion, but also for marketing, propaganda, for deception. <coughs> Um, and having models that are getting really good at that, perhaps superhuman at that, is, uh, is a brave new world. Um, thank you very much for the uh, comments that you just made. My name's Julia Lane. I'm with New York University, and I was a member of the National AI Research Resources Task Force, so thank you for the call out there. So, so one of the challenges that we had on the task force was uh, getting an operational definition of AI because it's neither a scientific field nor an industry. And I had spent, a, I'm a social scientist, I'm an economist by training. Uh, so I went in and I took a look at the way in which the HI index was structured um, and a lot of the uh, measures that you put up you don't have a statistical agency working with you. The, the measures seemed relatively ad hoc. And the um, use of uh, a lot of the work goes back to CSET, which is uh, measuring words that obviously change on an archive, on archive documents that Marty Hurst has shown is pretty biased. And then imputing AI um, back many periods. So I worry about the robustness. Uh, you mentioned Fei-Fei. Fei-Fei was on the committee as well, and she said, well, maybe we should just count AI based on uh, who goes to AI conferences. And, and clearly, you know, this is a, if, you, if you're going to talk about making investments in AI or the impact in AI, getting at the fundamental underlying construct of this and other emerging technologies, I think, might require a more substantive approach to thinking about the um, framework within which we're operating, if you're going to make policy decisions. I think for academic work, it's perfectly fine, but um, I, I am concerned about the quality of the underlying analysis. I wonder so what Julia, your good, good to see you again. Uh, let, me, let me touch on that. Um, uh, the, um, Definition of AI, no one's been able to come up with a, a good one. I know you've worked on it. We, I've had to address it a number of different times in our uh, census analyses, and different people have come up with it. I was just talking to Peter Norvig about it, who wrote a book on AI, and he doesn't feel like there's a good definition. People have used different definitions. I had a bunch of Jack Clark at the, yeah. at the report, and, and he said, you know, he wouldn't even defend the past 10 years. So I, I just worry when I see yeah. So we welcome um, help I, making it more grounded and more robust, and we're, we're working on that, and it would be terrific to have more of your input. The reason we pulled together this set of data was there was no place where all these different metrics were imperfect as they are, and the purpose was not to give the final answer to any of these questions. The purpose was to be a clearinghouse where we could, somebody like you and me could see what does CSET say? What does the census say? Uh, what do other metrics say? What happens when you count the words? What happens when you count the uh, benchmarks? What happens when you count the job postings? We do have the people going to conferences. We have the people uh, who are taking the courses. So all that information is collected, um, and it's available for researchers and policymakers to do more with. Um, and the more we can continue to refine it, but I, I don't. I, I think that you know. Hopefully, there are suitable caveats in the in the report that that point out that um, AI is not any single definition. And I think it sounds like you would like us to see more, have more caveats in there. And I think that's something we can look at doing. But I, I do think it should be understood that this we are collecting mostly data that exists in lots of dispersed places and bringing them to one place. But we are not. We don't have the ultimate authority to say this is 
the official growth of AI, because I, honestly, I don't think there is such a, a, a number. All we can report is what the data show. Thanks, uh, Matthew Shervenak from the Sunwater Institute. Um, and thank you for the thoughtful discussion. I'm, I'm curious about uh, going back to the regulatory question. Um, and I've, you know, I'd like to hear the panelists' thoughts on kind of two aspects of regulation. And on the one side, I'm mindful of uh, Tim Wu's, you know, the master switch. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that. But um, basically, the more regulation uh, in these kinds of fields, you know, it leads to more ultimately uh, a monopolist being the only one that can survive in that environment and it kind of reinforces basically if you, you, you know if it's totally free and no regulation you have many AIs right with many companies but if you regulate it the more heavily you regulate the more likely you are to have a single company with a single AI and I'm not sure which one's scarier um, the second question so I'd like to hear your perspective on that you know and whether regulation could lead to you know just a few companies or one company kind of dominating the space the second question is related to the AI, this regulation question is if you know we have more regulation in the US then all the innovation is just going to go somewhere else where you don't have the regulation so you wind up losing the innovation here and I'd like to hear your thoughts on on that piece sure uh, I'm going to go with Adam Smith on this who said that if you don't have regulation for antitrust then you can have a lot of uh, reduction of innovation and uh, uh, excessive uh, uh, what did he say, that, that uh, businesses often get together to fix prices and prevent free competition. So being pro-market, pro-consumer, pro-innovation does not mean necessarily having no regulation. It means making sure that you have the conditions in place to have that. It is certainly the case um, that regulation can lead to more concentration, and probably that happens more often than not. And many of the large incumbents have welcomed uh, regulation in part to keep out competitors, and that is a really negative outcome. But I don't think um, that you can assume that zero regulation leads to lots of competition either. Uh, as an economist, a lot of that's going to depend on uh, economies of scale, network effects, and there's lots of evidence that in AI, there may be some significant scale economies. Um, there's a reason that um, some of these companies are building bigger and bigger models that would be very hard for small people, smaller companies to build. I'm hoping the technology will evolve in such a way that small open source models will, will also be competitive. Um, but th those are some questions that are a function of technology as well as regulation. And one of the uh, ways that you make a marketplace successful is by putting in place the rules of the road that try to enforce competition and encourage competition. Unfortunately, we don't have a completely benevolent government that knows exactly how to create uh, in competition, and, and it may be captured by some of these players and end up reducing competition. So it's, it's, a, it's a hard choice. But I, I, don't, I'm not, I don't think there's a, a simple or universal answer that turning the dial all the way one way or the other way uh, is necessarily going to solve it. Right now, there's only a few players in the field anyways. So um, I mean, we don't, we don't have much regulation now. And, and there the are four key companies building these large models. So. If I would say one uh, easy regulation that I think we should be, we could all agree upon is transparency and require a disclosure uh, requirements on transparency. The data that goes into these models, the architecture of them, I think is really important. And to your second point, China actually has some of the most robust regulations on AI in place right now. The enforcement part we can talk about later, uh, but right now China actually has much more uh, thoughtful regulations than any other country. We've got two over here. Uh, one, of, one of your charts, you showed that low-wage jobs were more likely to be automated uh, than high-wage jobs. But of course, the incentives are higher to, to automate high-wage jobs. It's just that they're more, it's more difficult. Um, so 
I, I know it's very early to tell. Is that a projection of yours? Is that based on what is actually happening in the industry? And, and what are the effects of that for inequality? Because it seems like that could drive greater inequality rather than less. So I think that was one of my charts. So um, for much of the past 20 or 30, 40 years even, um, there's been skill bias technical change where the technology has disproportionately uh, augmented and helped high school workers and uh, automated or re reduced the demand for low skill workers. And that has led to increased inequality. And most economists see that as one of the forces why we have had increased inequality. Um, that chart I put up, which I'm glad you remember, was followed two slides later with another chart that went the other way around um, for the more recent uh, large language models where it was actually, it seemed like they were mostly affecting the higher wage jobs. And my takeaway is not that it's always one way or it's always the other way, but that the technology can evolve. We should keep our eyes on it. Um, if this new chart, the one that uh, Daniel Rock and company uh, uh, looked at for large language models proves to be more of the norm, it may be that the technology leads to wage compression. It did in that one case of the call centers that I looked at. Um, I don't want to generalize too much from one call center, one, case, one very well-written paper, even if it was mine. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, but there is some evidence that it could go that way. And I also want to underscore that it's not just technology. There are other, there's globalization. There's tax policy. There are other things at work. But to the extent that technology is a player, um, there are different technologies that are going in different directions. And uh, we're going to see how that, those play out. But the most recent wave seems to be towards less inequality. So I know it looks like we have a number of questions over here, maybe starting. All right, I'll start. Uh, I'm Shane. I'm a founder of Goldcoin, tech company here. I have just a pretty short question. I have a pretty short question. Is there a way to eliminate bias when you're creating these large language models? And if there was, would that decrease productivity? Uh, I, I, have a, I, I have a way of thinking about this. Um, Many um, of these technologies perpetuate and amplify bias, and that's a big problem. However, the humans have a lot of bias. And the reasons the models often generally have bias is because they've captured from humans. I'm a, of the view that the models are a lot easier to reduce bias in than humans. So we're on a path, and many of them have had a lot of reduction in bias. And so I welcome using these models not because they're perfect, but because they often improve on humans. As to eliminate bias, I don't think there's a way to completely eliminate it, partly because of the data, but also because it, there's many different types of bias. And it turns out that if you eliminate one kind of bias, you may amplify another kind of bias. And there are mathematical reasons that you can't have like type one, or let's call them false positives, um, be uh, completely equal across all groups without having false negatives be different. And if you try to make false negatives be the same across all groups, then false positives are going to be different. And you mathematically can't make them all unbiased on all different dimensions simultaneously. What the models will force you to do is be explicit about, A, how much you can reduce the bias, and B, what kind of trade-offs you're willing to do. Maybe it makes people uncomfortable. But I don't think that you're necessarily going to be completely able to reduce bias. In terms of uh, productivity, uh, um, there was a nice paper by um, Lindsay Raymond, who wrote that paper with me. But she wrote another paper with Daniel Lee earlier um, looking at hiring. And she found that um, the same model that reduced bias, a reinforcement learning model, also increased the likelihood that they would find really good candidates. So it was sort of a, a win on both dimensions. In that case, reducing bias was correlated with, with better outcomes, higher productivity, uh, better performance for the company. We have a question in the back. My name is Alan Rawl. I'm a privacy and cybersecurity lawyer at Sidley Austin and lecturer on law at Harvard. <laughs> Uh, my question relates to what uh, Eric raised about uh, the, the capabilities of the technology exceeding our wisdom and the emergent surprises of the technologies going beyond what we expect them to do. 
That echoes, uh, I think, an article that uh, Henry Kissinger and Eric Schmidt and MIT Dean wrote in the Wall Street Journal uh, in February, mm -hmm. uh, where they, ex they said it was striking that this is kind of the first uh, scientific technology where we're not able to understand how it works. So my, my question is, it, was that point that they made really true, that we don't understand now how the neural networks and the machine learning really works? and how the machines, the, the technologies, get better at, at what they do. Uh, are they right about that? Is that likely to perpetuate for either ever or for a really long time? And if so, what are the policy implications of that, that we really don't know how the AI technologies are producing the capabilities that exceed our expectations? Yeah, so, yeah, there is this concept of the black box. Like, you feed the data into the neural net, it runs you know, the probabilities, it goes through the transformation layer, and it outputs uh, a result that we don't quite know exactly how it got that result. Um, but there is a lot of work being done on transparency and explainability of these models. So um, your question around, like, will that always be the case? I don't think so. Um, there's a lot of people working on how to better um, explain what's going on. I mean, especially if we're going to implement these things in, like, medical settings. Um, we would want to know how it came up with a certain certain answer. I think we have time for uh, one more question. Hi, I'm, I'm Eric. I'm a management consultant. I had a question. Maybe this is a classic Turing trap question, but what does the future of the arts and humanities look like under AI, and how far are we from? I guess you could see people using ChatGPT to help with essays and homework and even AI-generated art, but how far are we from an AI producing the next classic in, in art or philosophy, per se? Yeah. Do I, so, um, you, well, I'll, yeah, so um, I don't have an answer of like what the future looks like for arts and creativity. Uh, I think that there is a lot of open questions, but, you know, uh, Images generated from some of these these models have won photography competitions and, and art competitions, uh, so the, we're gonna have to deal with with that like now. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what it looks like, but the, the conversations need to be had, and there's a lot going on. Uh, I mean, I'm hopeful there'll be a, a flowering, a flourishing of creativity and lots of new kinds of art and other things that are award-winning created. I think it is a potential you know, Turing trap type question where, where um, humans steering it could create new kinds of art that, that the machine alone or the human alone wouldn't create. In terms of the capabilities, I mean, they're just improving so rapidly. If you just look at Mid Journey, hopefully you guys are playing with Mid Journey too. Just like from a few months ago to now, it's improved dramatically. I had drinks with um, Imad Mustak, the founder and CEO of uh, Stability AI uh, about a month or two ago. And uh, he had just come from Hollywood, and uh, he's, he's a, a, a modest person. He told me that he, he told them all that he could do everything that they were doing, uh, that he could make artificial actors, artificial sets, artificial scripts. And I said, well, where are you going with this? He said, well, by the end of the year, I'm going to make an a, uh, Oscar-winning movie. So I don't know if he's actually going to do that or not, but that's sort of the way people are, are, uh, are imagining what they'll do. And uh, with that, I think we, uh, we're, at, we're at time. So I want to thank all of you uh, for the questions and for your, your, your presence here. And thanks to our panelists. And please join us for uh, wine and cheese after. Thank you. Thank you.